to sleep, go to sleep, you little baby. When you wake, get some cake and ride them pretty little horses. Black and little old horse, little old cow, ambling around on the old hay mow. Little old horse, he took a chew. Darned if I don't, said the old cow too. Go to sleep, go to sleep, you little baby. When you wake, get some cake and ride them pretty little horses. Black and a bay, a sorrel and a gray, whole heap of little horses. Black and a bay, a and a gray, whole heap of little horses. We have a very special guest this afternoon. Please make welcome Miss Margaret Shipman of 1942 and of Lee, Massachusetts. Wheel item number two is side B of this disc. This is Jeannot and Jeanette and fragments of the Quaker's wooing, the old maid song, and outlandish night sung by Margaret Shipman. Uh 
she sailed on the sea, and the name of the ship was the Weeping Willow Tree. As they sailed on the low and the lonesome water, as they sailed on the lonesome sea. They hadn't been a sailing two weeks or three Till they were overtaken by the golden silvery As they sailed on the low and the lonesome water As they sailed on the lonesome sea Well then cried the captain, what shall we do? The golden silvery will surely cut us in two as we're sailing on the low and the lonesome water, as we're sailing on the lonesome sea. Up stepped a little sailor, speaking mighty free, says, Captain, oh, Captain, what will you give to me? If I sink him in the low and the lonesome water, if I sink him in the lonesome sea. I will give you gold and I will give you fee. I'll give you my daughter and married you will be. If you sink them in the low and the lonesome water. If you sink them in the lonesome sea. He bowed to his breast and away swam he. He swam till he came to the golden silvery. As they sailed on the low and the lonesome water, as they sailed on the lonesome sea. He had a little auger fit for to bore. He bored nine holes in the bottom of the floor. As they sailed on the low and the lonesome water, as they sailed on the lonesome sea. Some were playing cards and some were shooting dice Till the salt water was flashing in their eyes As they sailed on the low and the lonesome water As they sailed on the lonesome sea Some had hats and some had caps A trying to stop the salt water gaps as they sank in the low and the lonesome water, as they sank in the lonesome sea. Oh, Captain, oh, Captain, take me back on board, for I have been just as good as my word. I have sunk them in the low and the lonesome water, I have sunk them in the lonesome sea. I know that you have been just as good as your word, but never no more will I take you in on board. Though you sunk them in the low and the lonesome water, though you sunk them in the lonesome sea, if it wasn't for the love of your daughter and your men, I would do unto you just as I had done unto them. I would sink you in the low and the lonesome water. I would sink you in the lonesome sea. He bowed to his back and down sank he, bidding farewell to the weeping willow tree. As they sailed on the low and the lonesome water, as they sailed on the lonesome sea. Thank you, that was beautiful. Maybe just to start very simply, you can say what a cranky is. Great. This is a cranky. Um, no, sorry, a cranky is a, um, well, these, the word cranky and this size and style of cranky come from the wonderful Bread and Puppet Theater of Northern Vermont, founded 50 years ago by Peter Schumann um, and his wife Elka, and um, we kind of found out about them through, uh, you know, they've, like, 
most traditions, they've kind of trained a crew of younger people, and so we kind of found out through through that through them um, 150 years ago that there was a a fad called the scrolling panorama, which was a much larger. Um, scrolling oil painting so there's one in a museum that's eight feet tall and a thousand feet long and it depicts a whaling voyage around the world and it's um so yeah that's cranky what brought you guys to the crankies uh, and what, what what keeps you in the crankies and also what do you feel like about the crankies that's so magical i've seen many cranky performances first from you then from my wife then from all these people in seattle there's a whole seattle cranky festival there's cranky festivals all over it seems like you guys are the Johnny Appleseed to Crankies. Like, everywhere um, you go, you plant the Cranky Seeds. What is it yeah. that's so captivating? Well, well, I mean, you tell us. I mean, it's, we started making them because we love these really old storytelling songs. But when, back in the day, in big quotes, um, you would hear these songs probably lots and lots of times. And you'd have lots of chances to really get into the story and find out what it was about. Um, now, when we're performing on a stage... You only get one chance to hear the song. So if you lose attention for a second, you will not know what's <laughs> happening or who just died or why. This happens to me a lot without the cranky. And um, <laughs> so we were like, how can we um, have people hear the ballad for the first time and really understand that it's about following the story? Yeah. Visuals. So that is kind of how we... That it was a very functional reason, I th in a way, of like how do we get people interested in ballads um, and get them kind of ro roped into it um, that way. Yeah, but I wouldn't say we're. It's kind of um, like Laurie Anderson says, um, you know, follow the story, whatever the story is telling you to do, or how to help tell the story on a stage. And so for a while, it's been crankies, and we're now kind of expanding, like, oh, what is possible to try to tell the stories? Because so much of what the old songs are story songs, so it's just kind of one way of us being storytellers. I like that. That's beautiful. Maybe you guys could each talk a little bit about your backgrounds and where you came from, because you both come from different places, and you're bringing very different ideas to the mix. Sure. True. I'll start. Great. Uh, I grew up um, playing classical music and um, loved Aaron Copeland a lot and um, fell into folk music in college, moved to eastern Kentucky, um, was super generously taught and welcomed into an amazing community of um, folks from Kentucky and Tennessee and there's some of them back there. Matt Kinman has taught me a lot. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was, you know, I was 18 and 19 and um, really hungry to learn how to play the banjo and the fiddle and, and was kind of, um, yeah, had a series of wonderful teachers in that part of the world. Um, and then right now I'm um, pretty, so I immersed in that and now I'm very immersed in uh, experimental music worlds and free improvised music and um, composition again. So um, I think our work now is, is this puzzle of like bridging those planets and that I feel like that's a big thing that I've been <laughs> pushing towards recently. It's almost like, full circle, so you came from this, yeah. kind of going back to where you originally yeah, started, like but with Aaron a different Co perspective. Right, you know, Aaron Copeland was someone who was trying to create an American vernac like uh, an American sound, and so he was quoting from Kentucky fiddle players um, to try to um, to try to use that as the building block of making new music. So yeah, it is a full circle for me in that way. And this is Anna Roberts Travolt. Oh yeah. yeah, I'm the Anna. Yeah, <laughs> Anna. <laughs> which leaves me to be Anne Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> And I grew up in southwestern Virginia, so I had a lot of old-time music and folk-type music around me. Not only were my neighbors playing a lot, and my family was in a band and singing around the house. I grew up hearing my mom sing a lot. Um, but I also grew up really being into reading books and theater, and that's how I came to ballads as my favorite thing about this old music. Um, so there are these really old storytelling songs, and I can remember just being in high school and like trying to learn monologues and being like, these aren't very good, but I'll tell you what is really good is this song about how this woman just stabbed her boyfriend for cheating on her, and then a magical bird is going to 
tell her why that was wrong. Um, and that's, good that's, it's a great ballot. Um, so when uh, Anna and I met, uh, she had already made a cranky, and I think a lot of the ideas that we started to talk about were about ways to present this music that was focused on story and involved more elements of theater than just, hey, here's a tune, it's very old, we're gonna sit in a chair and play it for you now, and you're gonna sit in a chair and listen. Because we can get really academic, so in a way it was like this, like, whoa, we have to be really creative, otherwise our show is just gonna be us talking like a lot at you. So it was like, <laughs> how can we not do that? Which we're doing right now. I Save love us. it. <laughs> Well, now that we've got the introductions out of the way and you guys have a bit of a background, should we ask them to do maybe a couple more songs? <laughs> yes. Please, will you? Oh, great. Do you want to do um, John? Sure. Tell us more stories. Tell us more stories. Excellent. Um, we'll, do, we'll do two, two ballads. Um, this first one, um, soak it in because it has a happy ending and that's rare. <laughs> And a beautiful description of antique male beauty, which is also rare. Yeah, not so bad. Cool, this is called John of Hazel Green.
comes the fleet lame moor. She was waiting in the wind when black eyed Susan came on board, saying, Where shall I, my true love, find? Tell me, jovial sailors, tell me true. Does my sweet William, does my sweet William sail among your crew? Will ye who high upon the yard rock by the billows to and fro? Soon as her well-known voice he heard, he sighed and cast his eyes below. The cords glide swiftly through his glowing hands, and quicker than lightning, and quicker than lightning on the deck he stands. Oh, Susan, Susan, lovely dear, my vows will ever true remain. Let me kiss off those falling tears We only part to meet again Change as ye listy winds My heart shall be The faithful compass The faithful compass that shall point to thee Believe not what the landsmen say They'll try to tempt thy constant mind They'll say that sailors went away in every port a mistress find. Yes, yes, believe them when they tell thee so. For thou art present, for thou art present wheresoe'er I go. If to fair India's coast I sail, thine eyes are seen in diamonds bright. Thy breath is Africa's spicy gale, thy skin is ivory so white. The pleasant breezes, wheresoe'er they blow, they bring me memories. They bring me memories of my lovely Sue. The bosun gave the dreadful word. The sails their swelling bosom spread No longer could she stay on board She turned, she sighed, and hung her head Her little boat unwilling rowed to land Adieu, she cried, adieu, she cried And waved her lily hand Those were powerful, very beautiful, thank you. Did you say where the, uh, both of those songs came from? Yeah, the first one comes from Virginia, um, and the second one comes from my home state of Vermont, um, from a man whose name was Asa... Ooh, so much activity. Um, from, it came from a man named Asa Davis, who worked at a creamery, and passed away in 1950, um, in a little town just north of Burlington, Vermont. You talked before about the stories in the songs and about also how the stories become so long and in intense. You created a lot of different ways to keep people focused on that. And then I, I consider myself somewhat of a connoisseur of your catalog, but I was just finding that you had this incredible project I really wanted to ask about yeah. where you took an old ballad, The Death of yeah. Queen Jane, which is yeah. one of the most powerful, heart-rending ballads it's there very, is. It's the saddest one I know. It's the saddest one there is. It's incredibly beautiful. Maybe you could just say a little bit about the ballad and oh, then how you worked with the length here. of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, there's this very sad ballad from upstate New York about, it's just basically about a, print, a queen and there's a bad thing that a man does to her in the forest um, and they turn out to be siblings and... It's very dark. It's a very, but very beautiful melody and very beautiful poetry in this. Um, and also, unfortunately, seems like a very timeless story of something that continues to happen um, today. So, um, very inspired by two of my favorite artists who are Marina Abramovic 
and uh, this Icelandic guy named Ragnar Kjartansson, who both work in durational um, ways, uh, we decided to sing the ballad for five hours at a, f a folk festival. So with our friend Tim Erickson, who's another wonderful ballad singer, um, as a way, kind of as Elizabeth mentioned, like all these songs, these old songs, like we're just continuing to sing these songs that have been sung hundreds of times. So we thought it would be a cool exercise to like just concentrate that experience of, of repeating something and, and, and um, so we set up in a small room, a workshop room at the festival and um, sat in a circle for five hours staring and took turns um, with the ballad. Uh, yeah, and the audience could come in and out as we were doing it. And sometimes there were two people in the audience and sometimes there were 30 people in the audience. There was one couple, they were composers it turned out, who were there the whole time which was awesome. <laughs> I, they were right across from me and I kept watching them. Um, yeah, and we just, I think we all sang the song like 20 minutes yeah. at a time. It's just a five minute song. So, you know, do the math. <laughs> we did it for five hours. Uh, and it, yeah, so that, um, yeah, we did that recently. <laughs> that sounds amazing. That, that brings it up a... was incredibly exhilarating. I don't know. Yeah. The first, that was surprising to the me. The first but. hour was terrifying because you're sitting there like, what did I just agree to do? And you're, I don't know if you've ever had to sit somewhere, but you're like, how do I sit? I don't know how to sit <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yeah. My, um, your eye starts to... But the twitch. fifth hour was... Yeah, the fifth hour was very, like, you pass through... Kind of like any, probably anyone who's run a long distance, there's a moment where you're like, oh, the pain is gone. Like, I could have done this for another hour. Um, so we want to do it again sometime, but for longer. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yeah. It brings up an interesting point, though. Um, my, my day job is radio publicity, and recently we had an artist who had a song banned from the radio oh. because it was a murder ballad. He had written a new murder ballad about a man who murdered his wife and was racked Whoa. by the guilt, or lover, was racked by the guilt in prison. Yeah. It was based on a kind of standard precept. And a lot of these murder ballads, it seems, are becoming less and less acceptable in the way people perceive traditional music. Yeah. I, how do you guys deal with... A lot of this music it goes into really dark areas, areas that are dark in the 1920s, but they were dark in the 1520s as well when the song may have originated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I think... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think it's to broaden the question a little bit. I think it's just... I think... There's such this air of nostalgia to a big reason why a lot of us got into folk music, whether it's at, as singers or as people in the audience or as people who play for fun. Um, there's that sense of like, wow, is this music from a simpler time or it makes me feel happy or it like makes me feel calm compared to all this other music. And I think what we do and are interested in is like all this stuff that's actually not very nostalgic at all and not very comfortable and not and like yeah it would be great to live in the 1900s and not be able to vote like you know what I mean like there's this complexity to wanting to be a part of the past and and as like caretakers that we all are of this tradition there's like this ugliness too mm. and so a big part of whether it's like a specific song or not I think part of what we're trying to do is like figure out ways to like toe that line of like make like pleasing you and like doing things that feel good and comfortable and then being like, well, what's the limit of like something that feels uncomfortable or, or challenging or questioning, which, mm. which is, you know, I think, yeah, it's yeah. balance we try to strike. Yeah. I feel like sometimes uh, folk music as family programming is a little bit like taking kids to go see Romeo and Juliet. It's like Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Old. Yes, of course. It's very appropriate, but is it? Um, and also that I think in our work, um, rather than try to paint with such broad strokes, we've tried pretty hard to focus on individual songs and stories from individual singers and musicians um, whose lives were, you know, we all know this rationally, but they were just as complete as ours. They had lightness and they had darkness. And we try to show that. That's a nice response. I like that. It, it brings me to my next question, which is that um, you guys have done really interesting work in terms of field work, where you've gone and uh, looked at like very well-known traditional musicians, but then looked at their families and traced the music through their families. Often these really 
very famous traditional musicians, the families don't get a lot of credit after the musician passes. Yeah. And also the music is often passed matrilineally. A lot of folk and Appalachian music is passed by mothers and passed through families. And you've done work that I've never seen anyone do before in that field. What brought you to that? And also, do you feel that the, the women have been kind of discredited in the way the music has passed through the centuries? Well, women are usually discredited as a blanket statement. But Big <laughs> topic. <laughs> but we won't address... We can't... We don't have time for that. Um, but... Uh, yeah, we try to meet as many of the families of these singers as we can. Um, on one hand, creatively, who better than the granddaughter of a singer you like to help you realize that you don't have to sound like her grandmother? You know, like, you're sta sitting there in front of someone and they're, like, telling you about their grandmother and you're like, here's the song. They're not like, oh, you know, it really doesn't sound... Like, they already know you're not their grandmother like <laughs> it's very evident to them and I think just from a creative standpoint as you're trying to learn this music of these people who are past and you're trying to sort out what is your voice and what is their voice I think the family has been really helpful to to sort that out because they can kind of give you a sort of permission to be yourself within this music that that it's hard to get from a recording or from another academic person um, because because the family is, yeah, I, and I think it's also because we're going to the families, we're kind of, yeah, we're trying to honor them and say, hey, your family has made this song possible to be alive in 2017, thank you. And, um, and in that asking, in that thanks, we're also asking, hey, can I be the custodian of a public, can I be a public custodian of your family heirlooms? Because I am very moved by them and I think other people will be. Um, and and it, to, me, it's, to me that's important that, um, that we get the permission because we are carrying around other people's family heirlooms and, and there's like a publicness to it. Like it's, we think of, oh, it's folk music, it's music for everyone and it totally is. But I think there's also like that thing of like, you know, there's a spectrum of how private or public some families are, and it, and it feels like if, if what our thing is is to go around and talk about other people, um, our dad is a, a journalist, so I feel like also just kind of what is the code of ethics of sharing other people's music, and I feel like relating to the family is a way of kind of um, asking them, what, like, well, what do you think? What's fair to you? Yeah, I like that. Okay, I should probably stop the heavy conceptual questions now. <laughs> no! Thank you for that. <laughs> Do you guys want some more music? Should we encourage more music? Yes, please. We'll do one from a family um, that we hold dear. Mm. It's on my guitar. It's capo. It's from the Gladden family slash the Smith family of um, Smith County, Virginia, where Elizabeth is lives. Makes men love them. And I see, and I 
cause you hard labor all behind the old brick wall. And I see, and I see on the fourth day of July. A story. It's a true story. Maybe speaks a little bit back to what we had been yammering about. Can we get the stage lights off? All off. Surprise question. All right. All the way. Yeah. All right. We had a friend named Letha Sexton, who was in her 80s and lived in a little white house in central Kentucky um, on a farm. And we would visit her when we could. And you should move it in the front if you want. Um, and we would sit in her, we'd sit in her kitchen for hours and she would feed us and then she would tell us this story. She said, when I was a little girl, I lived on the banks of the Red River. And to grow up back then was very different from the way kids grow up now. We didn't have TV, we didn't have radio. So you had to make your own fun. But I was lucky because I lived near Miss Lella. And if you lived near Miss Lella, you had it made. She would play hopscotch with all of us neighborhood kids she was a short, squat little lady, and she wore glasses, and she giggled all the time like she was a kid. She grew a beautiful garden. I remember Miss Lella loved flowers. She took us into the woods behind her house, and there she taught us to hunt for squirrel. Miss Lella was a great shot, and she could skin the hides off those things faster than any man could. She loved being outdoors. Lots of days she would go down the bank, get in her little boat, and catch fish on the river. She had a pet crow which she caught and tamed. She taught it to talk, and when she called, it would fly down and land on her shoulder and stay there a while. She also had a pet cat whose name was Kitty Press. And her husband, Claude, would feed the cat hot buttered biscuits under the table. And so they had a good fat cat. One winter when I was small, my mother lost a child in childbirth. And I remember Miss Lella at the front door with a bouquet of white flowers for my mother. She was just a precious person. Miss Lella didn't have children of her own, but she kind of adopted the whole neighborhood. So we'd all run down to her house after school. She'd always welcome us in, and she'd always fix us the best snacks. She had a huge wood stove in her kitchen, and she would pop popcorn for us, and she'd fry hot griddle cakes right on top of her stove. She, in her living room, had a red velvet couch where she kept all her instruments. She could play anything with strings on it. She would take her fiddle out onto the front porch. And she would play for us. And when she played, us kids would get up. And we would dance and dance. All of our community knew of Miss Lella as a fiddler, so folks that had a party or a dance would ask her to come and play. 
She was always ready to go. She never went anywhere without her fiddle or her rifle with her. She would meet up with her friends and they would sit down to play music together. And they have wonderful memories of her. They would say, Oh, Miss Lella played the prettiest music you ever heard. She would roll the notes in there, just perfect. If we started playing at supper time, we might not stop until 12 o'clock or one in the morning. And Miss Lella would hang right in there. She wouldn't quit playing until she about fell over. was in her first heaven playing music. And that's the story that we heard at Letha Sexton's house in her kitchen. After that, we would usually get in her car and she'd drive us to the cemetery where Miss Lella is buried next to her husband, Claude. And then we'd go further down the road to where Miss Lella's house used to stand and Letha would say, oh, I can just picture her standing there with her pet crow on her shoulder, just like it was yesterday. She said, I, I wouldn't miss that life, just living by her for the world. We're running pretty low on time, but we do have a little bit of time to open up to questions from the audience. Do you guys have any questions you'd like to ask Anne and Elizabeth? Yeah, yes, sir. We make them together. Who makes yeah. the crankies, and? We do. Yeah, if you go you, on your Instagram, I think you guys have photos of some of the process, and it's like whole rooms covered yeah. in scraps of fabric. Yep, pretty much. Yep. <laughs> yes, ma'am. How did you guys meet? Oh, we met when I, moved, when I lived in uh, rural Virginia as well. So we were both living in small towns in the countryside, about an hour apart, and small music scene. And yeah, we met. It was bound to happen. <laughs> Kismet. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to know about the guitar. Oh, it's a, nine, guitar. it's a 1937 Martin Arch Shop that I bought in Elkins, West Virginia. From Bob Smacula, who often has sold many of that model, if you like it. The C1. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, folks? Yes, sir. Oh, the tuning box. The yeah, Trudy box? end up playing it yeah, in the this Trudy set. Box. But we'll play it later at our next set, which is at 6.30. Yeah. Where's it's the, Indian. Where's the next set at 6.30? Oh, you'll have to it look at your program, be. team. Uh, <laughs> um, the tree, tree line, line stage. Tree line stage. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this is now. This is that's why I write things down. <laughs> but yeah, this is a shrewdy box. Yep. How do you spell it? Oh man, we'll what? talk. A- that's enough about that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> More about the shrewdy box later. Yeah. Another question? Yes, sir. In the back. Yeah, actually, it's on our website. There's, like, a link to this uh, YouTube. There's no video. We didn't take video, but, um, yeah, there's a recording of all five hours that you can... And some photos of, you know, us being sitting and the light changing. I can't believe you chose that ballad. It's like Game of Thrones, that ballad. It is brutal. It is like Game of Thrones. Yeah, but but it did... Well, Game of Thrones is like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe you could play one more song, but okay. first I'd love to ask, maybe we should just say what you guys have coming up, because oh, you have like in plans for a new album that I'm yeah, very curious we're, about. Yeah, we're making a new album right now um, with a producer who usually makes pop music, um, and we're making, we're recording these songs that we've been working on um, for the last two 
years, and we, we made a seven inch with this guy, ben, Benjamin Lazar Davis, who plays in a band called Cuddle Magic, and also works with a woman, Jonas Policewoman, who's a great New York hero of mine. And um, we got Jim White from the Dirty Three to play drums on it. And um, we're getting an amazing experimental pedal steel player, um, who's one of my favorite musicians named Susan Alcorn, is playing on it. So. Um, and I'm learning Pro Tools for it. So <laughs> it's a very classic Anna and Elizabeth project. Every, like, we made this being like, hey, do you know how to paper cut? We're like, eh, <laughs> don't know. So this is kind of... Um, <laughs> it's right in line. <laughs> this is right in line. This record is, I guess, inspired by um, wanting to try even harder to communicate what's in our brains to you guys. So in a way, um, I guess questioning... You know, we try to present the old songs in a kind of clear way, right? So we listen through these old scratchy recordings and try to deliver them in a clear way that you understand. Um, but I think wanting to, to complicate that because there's all these fragments um, hanging out in our head. We have a lot of footnotes in how we think of these songs. And right. so there's a lot that we don't understand. Yeah. And we're and interested a, in conveying that as well. Yeah. To you. And, and so <laughs> having this record that feels like there's space to try to put some footnotes or some kind of to have it feel layered mm. so that it expresses in some ways that um, that relationship that we have with the songs is not these just simple, clear things. We're like, I don't totally know why that man is coming out of the forest in that song. So maybe let's just make a sonic forest. So um, yeah. If you want to be involved with the making of this record where we have Good a job. pledge music campaign, which you can look up for 20 more days and you can yeah. basically pre-order the record on our website. Do you guys have maybe, we're almost out of time, do you have one, one short song to play yeah, us sure. out? Do you guys want one more song? Yeah. Mother? Oh yeah. Uh, Mother is With great. the Shruti Box. With the Shruti Box. Yeah. Because it was of so much interest to you guys. S-H-R-U-T-I. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm the bad cop, she's a good cop. <laughs> All right. So this is another song, um, from the state of Vermont. A lot of the, we should mention the songs on the record are from both of the places that we grew up because surprise, surprise, folk music is not just from the South. It's from everywhere. Every place has music. Um, this is so, this is a song from the MacArthur family from Southern Vermont. Father in the graveyard and I'm on the Look for 
Jennifer Crow. This is Anna Roberts-Cavall.